Why hello my fellow apes, I hope you're well and that you're not eating. Like seriously, if you're eating, pause this video and come back later because things are about to get really uncomfortable really quick. You've uh, you've been warned. Show me the evidence, show me the evidence. 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 Show me the Show me the evidence, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, the evidence, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, the evidence, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, the evidence. Show me the evidence, show me the evidence, show me the evidence. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone welcome back to another episode of the Islamic Calling Podcast so I'm back with uh, uh, Stephen or should I say Rationality Rules so I haven't made a video on uh, Stephen in a while now so I figured you know what let's make another video on him and let's see what he's been up to and it turns out he's making videos on worms <laughs> so recently he made a video on uh, Jordan Peterson where Jordan Peterson had a conversation with Stephen Fry yeah that's Stephen Fry so I figured, you know what, let's see what, what he says and uh, then I'll make my response inshallah. So let's take a look and see what he says. Conchiliasis, which is derived from the Latin affliction with little dragons, is a parasitic infection caused by the guinea worm. A person becomes infected by drinking water that contains microcrustaceans infected with guinea worm larvae. And once one's stomach acid dissolves the crustaceans, the larvae then penetrate your digestive tract, escaping into your body. Where over the following year, they grow up to 80 centimeters or 31 inches in length. Disgusting. The worms then mate, with the males dying shortly after, but the females eventually migrate to your subcutaneous tissue, where they cause an extremely painful blister to erupt that compels you to submerge the wound in water. Then, over several days or weeks, the worm slowly emerges from the laceration and expels thousands of larvae into the water, which in turn infects crustaceans, thus continuing the so-called BEA beautiful circle of life. Now, if there is a god, and he is, as theists tend to insist, all-powerful and all-loving, then for what possible mysterious reason did he create these disgusting fiery serpents, as they've been referred to in scripture? Okay, so this is something the atheists always do. So you will notice that atheists, whenever they make this type of like, uh, you know, argument from evil uh, type arguments, they always use the most extreme examples. <laughs> so basically here he is committing the appeal to extreme fallacy. So in case you guys don't know, appeal to extreme fallacy is a fallacy when you, where you use the most extreme example as the norm, when in reality it's not the norm, right? So here he is using this uh, example of this disease, of this parasitic disease, where uh, you know people get infected by this disease, and this worm slowly come, comes out of the body. So when you hear about it, obviously it sounds very disgusting, right? But the thing is that this this disease act is actually very uncommon. It's not it's it's rare. But he's using this type of like extreme cases to show ah look how bad things are in nature, right? And completely ignoring all the other like normal things that exist in nature. Imagine if I said this, right? Imagine if I used, if I said that atheists are all bad people and I use like Pol Pot as an example. Now, obviously, that's, that's ridiculous because Pol Pot is like the most extreme example of an atheist, right? You can use him as an example. He's like the exception. And that's the problem here, right? Appeal to extreme fallacy is usually fallacious because these type of extreme examples are the exception. They're not the rule. So you cannot use the exception as a rule. Now, this disease in particular is known as uh, dranculiasis. Uh, uh, so according to World Health Organization, they said the following. Dranculiasis is a crippling parasitic disease on the verge of eradication with 27 cases, 27 human cases reported in 2020. So here you can clearly see that there are only like 27 people that are affected with this <laughs> and he's using this as in like an example oh look how bad like nature is right because he's trying to make it seem like uh, god is evil uh, and he's using this as an example uh, but this disease 
is so rare that it only happens affects like affected like 27 people <laughs> so this is a very rare disease now as for why this type of disease exists well Allah SWT actually answers this question in the Quran itself for example he says <laughs> Do the people think that they will be left to say we believe and they will not be tried? You can read about this in Quran 29.2. For example, in another verse it says the following, And we will surely let them taste the nearer punishment, short of the greater punishment that perhaps they will return you can read about this in quran 32 21. now if you read the tafsir of this verse it says uh, ibn kathir actually breaks this down and he says that basically the reason why trials and tribulations exist is because allah SWT wants to test us right he has put us on earth to test us so earth is not supposed to be some kind of paradise you're supposed to go through trials and tribulation that's one of the main purposes <laughs> why allah SWT has put us here right to test us and the reason he sends this type of trials and tribulation is to see if we're actually uh, sincere or not uh, whether we turn towards him or if we uh, move away from him right this is what's interesting is that if you just uh, think about it just on a basic on surface level you might think that oh so he wants people to turn uh, simply believe in him that's why he's sending all these diseases but it's actually much more deeper than that because turning towards Allah doesn't simply mean that you just simply believe in Allah, right? For example, in Islam, we believe that turning towards Allah comes with a lot of different things. It's not just that you have to believe in Allah. It also means the five pillars, right? Uh, the declaration of faith, or the shahada, the prayer, uh, giving zakah, fasting, all, or pilgrimage, or hajj, right? All of these things are part of this uh, turning towards Allah, right? As you guys have noticed, one of these five is the zakah or the charity, right? And uh, now in Islam, we have this concept of giving obligatory charity, and this is a very important pillar of Islam. This is something you have to do, it's obligatory. This charity can take many forms. We can help people like this who are suffering in places like uh, where these type of diseases exist, right? The point here is that the reason Allah SWT uh, since this type of trials and tribulation is to test us, right? And part of that test is to see whether we do the right thing, whether we give charity, whether we turn towards him in, in obedience, right? And when we give charity I and mean, when we turn towards him in obedience, this automatically reduces suffering. Because if you give charity to people, then they can that use that money to, you know, get better medicine, get better uh, health care, right? And this way, you can fight things like uh, this type of disgusting diseases, right? So in a way, Allah SWT actually makes sure that we as human beings uh, can become better people. And that's why he sends suffering, right? Because when he sends this type of suffering and trials and tribulation, this forces us to be good people. Because without suffering, how are, how are we supposed to be good people? That's just not possible. <laughs> because people without this type of test or this type of hardship, they don't want to you know help people they don't want to like they don't want to be good otherwise this is actually quite beautiful because so he sends suffering to reduce suffering for me the word evil means that when you make someone suffer without any good or logical reason and if he's and if he's causing people to be good then what he's doing is not evil so we can put this in a logical form premise one if Allah SWT causes suffering so we turn to him give charity and be better people then Allah SWT causing suffering is not evil premise 2 Allah SWT does cause suffering so we turn towards him give charity and be better people conclusion therefore Allah SWT causing suffering is not evil also this is something we can logically prove as well according to a study published in nature actually uh, in his abstract it says the following in the face of crisis wars pandemic and natural diseases both increased selfishness and increased gener generosity may emerge in this paper, we study the relationship between the presence of COVID-19, threat and generosity using four-year longitude database, capturing real donations made before and during the pandemic, as well as allocations from a six-month dictator game study during the early months of the pandemic, consistent with the notion of uh, catastrophic compassion, 
and contrary to some uh, prior research showing a tendency towards self-interest behavior under threat. Uh, individuals across both data set exhibited greater financial uh, generosity when their country experienced COVID-19 threat. While we find that the presence of threat impacted individuals uh, giving behavior was not sensitive to threat level, our findings have significant societal uh, our findings have significant societal implications and advance our understanding of economic and psychological theories of social preference under threat. So here we can clearly see that when disease or disaster come, this actually increases people's generosity, right? So again, this again only further proves my point, which is that these type of disease or, or tribulations exist so that we can be better people. And this forces us to be better people. Because without these type of trials, how are we supposed to be better people, right? So from this, we can make an argument, which is the following. Premise one. If natural disaster increases people's generosity, then causing natural disaster cannot be called evil. Premise 2. Natural disaster does increase people's generosity. Conclusion. Therefore, causing natural disaster cannot be called evil. Also, another thing is that in Islam, we believe that non-Muslims will be rewarded for their good deeds on earth, right? However, they will receive nothing in the hereafter for their disbelief. For example, in a hadith in Sahih Muslim, it says, Anas bin Malik reported that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu said, Verily, Allah does not treat a believer unjustly in regards to his virtue. Uh, he would confer upon him his blessing in this world and would give him reward in the hereafter. And as regards to non-believer, he would be made to test the reward of virtue in this world, what he has done for himself so much that when it would be the hereafter, he would find no virtue for which he should be rewarded. You can read about this in Sai Muslim 2808. So the reason Allah SWT sends this type of disaster or uh, diseases is so that we can be better people, so that we turn towards Him, right? So that we turn towards Him in worship. And part of that worship is that we help other people. And by helping other people, we reduce suffering. <clears throat> so by sending this type of uh, challenges to us, He's actually reducing suffering. And if He's reducing suffering, then that cannot be called evil. But regardless, let's continue. This is the question that Stephen Fry posed on the meaning of life when the host said the following. Suppose it's all true mm. and you walk up to the pearly gates and you are confronted by God. What will Stephen Fry say to him, her or it? And Fry's response ruffled the feathers of many, including evidently Jordan Peterson, who in his recent conversation with Fry sought to challenge him, which without further ado, We'll get to now. Right. Okay. I'm going to read something and forgive me. No. I want to go here. You're face to face with God. <laughs> Bone cancer in children. Bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? Hmm. What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? How dare you create a world where there is such misery that's not our fault? It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? Stephen Fry's rant is some of the most dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I know I saw this a long while ago, but this rant is one of the dumbest thing I've ever seen, okay? So basically here, and this is a pattern with like atheists, which is that they're committing the hasty generalization fallacy. So they're basically taking this small amount of suffering and then generalizing it uh, based on this small amount of suffering, right? But again, these type of sufferings are, like I said, very rare or exceptional. First of all, in Islam, we believe that all children go to heaven or Jannah, right? Especially Muslim children. Now, there's a difference of opinion uh, among scholars as to whether uh, non-believer, children of non-believers immediately go to heaven or if they're tested. But the strongest opinion is that uh, they go to heaven. And that is the strongest opinion. And that is the opinion I take. For example, there's a Sahih Hadith where it clearly says that when Prophet uh, was, Prophet actually saw children of disbelievers in paradise so this clear cut proves that you know all children will go to paradise right before they have reached puberty so all children goes to heaven 
So if all children goes to heaven, then Stephen Fry's argument is dead on water because if they're going to heaven, which is far better, eternally better than anything on earth, then it doesn't matter if they have suffered a little bit on earth because heaven is far better than earth. So if you lost children, trust me, your children is far better off than you are <laughs> right now. Okay, so yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a dumb point. Also in the Quran, Allah SWT says, and do good. Truly, Allah loves Al uh, Muhsinun, the good doer. You can read about this in Al Baqarah 2195. Helping the one who is sick and serving him is an act of charity. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Helping a man onto his uh, mount or lifting up his luggage onto it is a charity. You can read about this in Narrator uh, in Muslim 1009. In this Quran verse, you can clearly see that Allah SWT is telling us to do good. Imagine a scenario where Allah SWT sent no trials and tribulation on earth, right? Then how are we supposed to show kindness? It's not possible. I mean, you cannot visit the sick without there being sickness. You cannot treat the sick without there being sickness. You cannot feed the poor without there being poor, <laughs> right? So in order for this type of amazing and beautiful kindness and merciful nature to come out to exist suffering has to exist another thing to note is that this type of suffering is very limited it's very short right it's not everlasting because in the hereafter we will be rewarded for all this right you know there's a hadith where it says that Allah will ask people that if did you ever face any suffering on earth and they will say that no because there's so much pleasure in heaven that we won't even remember any type of suffering so it doesn't matter but by giving suffering in this world, he's actually causing people to be good. He's causing people to show generosity. And that is a beautiful thing. That is not evil. Only this type of like idiot kind of like atheist would think that this is somehow evil. This is not. Okay. So based on this, we can make this argument, which is that. Premise one, if suffering leads to kindness, then suffering is necessary. Premise two, suffering does lead to kindness. Conclusion, therefore suffering is necessary. The specific parasitic disease that Fry was referring to here is called onchocerasis, but it's more commonly known as river blindness. And likewise to the guinea worm, it's pure nightmare fuel. Unlike the guinea worm, however, you don't need to drink anything to get it. Rather, infected black flies need to drink you, and in doing so deposit larvae into your body. A few moons later, the adult worms then produce larvae of their own, which make their way to your skin, where they can infect any black flies that bite you, thus continuing, again, the circle of life. For the naturalist, parasites like these are easy to explain. In fact, they're expected. Mother Nature is not conscious, and so she doesn't care for our plight. But for the vast majority of theists, who believe that God is all-powerful and all-loving, we have to ask, why? Why do these devastating parasites exist? Okay, so this argument may work for in Christianity, but it definitely doesn't work in Islam because in Islam we don't believe that God is sim, uh, you know, God is only loving, right? Because in Islam we believe that God has many different attributes, and one of those attributes is that He's wise, right? So and because He's wise, He's He uses this type of disease and trials and tribulation to make us better people, and as I've explained before, right? Also, again, here, he's committing the appeal to extreme fallacy again. I mean, these type of parasitic diseases are rare. <laughs> For example, according to the World Health Organization, out of like 8 billion people, only a million people are affected by this. And it is decreasing continuously, right? So, yeah, this is a, again, this is a very rare type of disease that mostly exists in Africa and other places. And also another thing is that I find is really kind of dishonest about this type of problem of evil arguments, which is that, they're inconsistent, right? Here they're committing the fallacy of inconsistency. So basically, you'll notice that Stephen is basically complaining about losing, you know, people losing their eye, but he never thanks Allah for giving him eyes for free. <laughs> I mean, how much does it cost to buy a camera, Stephen? What, thousands of dollars? And yet, Allah SWT gave you an eye, which is better than most cameras on the market, <clears throat> and you never thank him. And yet, when he takes that away from you, you start bitching and complaining. Do you know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like to me a guy, you know, a whiny, whiny, whiny teenager who never thanks his parents when they do something nice for him. At the moment, they'd like take away his like uh, cell phone because he's wasting his time and not studying properly. Uh, the moment they do that, you start complaining. That's what you guys sound like to me. <laughs> I'm being completely honest here. 
Also, Allah SWT actually refutes this atheist ungratefulness in the Quran. He says the following. The most merciful taught the Quran created man and taught him eloquence. The sun and the moon move by precise calculation, and the star, the trees, pros uh, prostrate, and the heaven, and he raised and imposed the balance that you not transgress within the balance and establish weight in justice and do not make division the balance. And the earth he laid out for the creatures. Therein is fruit and palm trees having sheaths of dates and, gr and grain having hunks of seeded plants. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? And this is actually a very beautiful verse and I highly recommend Stephen to, for you to read this uh, chapter of the Quran. It's uh, Quran 55, 1 to 13. So basically what Allah SWT is saying, he is actually challenging this ungrateful people that is created, that never thanks him. And he challenges them and he tells them all the things he's doing for them, right? All the love and mercy he's showing to them, okay? Every single part of your body, Stephen, belongs to Allah. He's making sure, because in Islam, we believe that everything depends upon Allah. He causes everything, right? If not even a leaf falls without him uh, causing it, right? So everything is caused by Allah. So when you breathe, every time you're breathing, you're breathing because Allah SWT is causing you to breathe. You're alive because Allah SWT is causing you to be alive every moment of your day. Okay? So every time you breathe, every time your heart beats, every time you look, you're able to see color. Every time you're able to see, taste something. Every time you're able to show kindness or every time you're, feel, you're feeling happiness. Every time you're, uh, you, you feel loved because of your family members. All of that is thanks to Allah. So the amount of mercy he's showing to you is infinite, Stephen. It's not something you can ever repay him for. Repay him for. And this is why Prophet said that Allah's mercy is greater than a mother. Okay, because a mother can only do so much. But Allah SWT is literally moving heavens and earth for you. So that you can be alive. So that you can insult him. People like you and Stephen Fry can insult him. And he is literally moving, like, literally moving heavens and earth for you guys. So that you, can, you guys can stay alive. And you never thank him. Instead, you insult him. And then the moment he like sends some small little test, you start whining like little bitches. And that's the reality. I mean, this is like, you know, when you have a neighbor and imagine you have a really nice neighbor, right? And that neighbor always gives you free things, right? Then, then one day he stops giving you these free things and you get really angry and you start saying, ah, this is such an ungrateful neighbor. No, you never deserve those three things in the in the first place. Same here, we don't deserve any of this. We don't deserve our body. We don't deserve all the happiness we get. I mean, we literally get food for free. <laughs> we don't deserve any of this. And yet, Allah SWT is giving it to us out of mercy, out of love. And all he asks is that you recognize him. And you, don't, you guys don't, not only are you guys not doing that, you guys are insulting him. How is this fair? And you, you are insulting him because he's sending a little bit of trials for you so that you can be better people. Again, how is this fair? But regardless, let's continue. The argument is logical, and it was expressed in logical form 2,300 years ago. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. So this is like this uh, argument from evil that atheists contest constantly use. And no, this argument is not logical because like for example we have to, we don't have to deal with that first point uh because all we have to do is deal with the second point and the second point is saying that can god stop evil then he can stop evil but he's choosing not to do it and if he's choosing not to do it then he's evil right that's the argument but the thing is that someone doesn't become evil for simply causing suffering okay I mean, if that's the logic, then you have to say that every doctor is evil <laughs> because they cause suffering. You have to say that every mother is evil when they discipline their child. You have to say that every police, when they catch a, arrest a criminal, is evil 
but they're not evil. They they have a reason for why they're causing suffering. So if you have a reason, a good logical reason for causing suffering, then that's not evil. Okay, so this premise is false. Okay, it doesn't follow. 65 million years before us, 75% of species on Earth, including billions of sentient beings, were vanquished in an extinction that God either deliberately conducted or was powerless to prevent. Think of the suffering inflicted upon so many. <laughs> okay, so let me turn the table, right? Think of the suffering that that bacteria or that worm that was killing those children endured when it was being pulled out. Think of the suffering of those black flies that are causing people sickness when they're being killed. Think of the suffering of those killer worms <laughs> that causes death. Think of the su suffering of the, you know, the bacteria and the viruses that causes people sickness when they're being destroyed or they're being killed right it doesn't quite make sense right because if there's a good reason to kill a living thing when it's causing harm this that's completely justified right it's possible that it's the same reason why Allah Sota may have done it right because you need to understand back in the age of the dinosaurs some of those creatures were very very dangerous <laughs> I mean do you honestly think that people would be able to survive if things like dinosaurs existed now <laughs> Have you not seen like Jurassic Park? And and that's the thing, like if there's a good reason to kill something that is harmful or dangerous, then it should be killed. And it's possible that Allah SWT has a good reason for doing it, right? He wouldn't just kill these things unless there's a good reason for it. And we believe there's a good reason for it. And one possible reason could be that to keep us safe, to keep the humans safe. But Allah knows why he did this. Also in Islam, we believe that all creatures will be gathered on the Day of Judgment. For example, Ibn Kathir said, it was narrated by uh, Abdul Razak in, in Musnaf, by I mean, Zubair al-Bayhaqi in Bath, Abu Huraira said that concerning the verse interpretation, there is not a moving living creature on earth, nor a bird that flies with its two wings, but our community is like you. We have neglected nothing in the book. Then unto their Lord they all shall be gathered. You can read about this in Al-Anam 638. All creatures will be gathered on the day of resurrection, animals, beasts, birds, and everything. Then Allah's justice on that day will reach such an extent that Allah will settle the score for the hornless animals with the horned one. Then he will say, be dust, at which point the disbeliever will say, would that I were dust. You can read about this in uh, Surah Al-Naba 78.40. You see, in, see this hadith in sub Kathir 3255. So you can see that how merciful and just Allah SWT is. On the day of judgment, Allah SWT will literally gather all the creatures or living creatures that existed on earth and deliver justice to them. Okay, He will make it up for them, right? So here you can clearly see Allah SWT is how, how merciful and just Allah SWT is. He's literally taking animals and delivering justice to them. Okay, SubhanAllah. And this is why we worship Allah, because He is the just, He is the most just. Sorrowful, very often, and I am united in my admiration for the fact and the real belief I have that most people, fundamentally, given this dysfunction or this deep trauma, most people are so good, are so anxious to be good, are, are deontically good, have, have a sense of obligation and, and, and drive in them to be better than they are. I think that's, that's one of the key things I love about humanity, is not just that we are dissatisfied with things that are wrong and can be improved, but with ourselves we are dissatisfied, and that most of us want to be better. Okay, so what I find funny is that Stephen Fry actually refused his own argument. <laughs> So he's saying that he believes that people are good and people are nice, right? And yes, this is true. In Islam, we also believe that people are good. But people are only good because Allah SWT gave them the capacity to be good. Okay? So if Allah didn't give people capacity to be good, they couldn't be good. Also, you can't be good if there's no evil or if there's no injustice, if there's no suffering. How can you be good without suffering? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so in order for you to be good, there has to be suffering. So suffering is not meaningless. There's a reason why suffering exists. It exists so that we can be better people and we can fight this suffering. The notion of an atheist being charged with an infinite punishment, hell, for the finite crime of using the brain that God gave them is something I find not only utterly illogical and pathetic, but straight up evil. Okay, so this whole like uh, hellfire thing, I already refuted this argument uh, against Allah SWT. I mean, any crime against Allah SWT is not finite, okay? Because Allah SWT, as I explained, is showing you infinite mercy. Every time you're alive, every time you take a breath, okay? All of this, is, the value of these things are infinite in nature, okay? He's showing infinite amount of mercy. He's showing infinite amount of kindness to you. 
When you deny his kindness, his mercy, and act like he doesn't exist, then that is an infinite crime. Imagine you have a mother, and your mother lost you as a child, and then finally he, she is able to find you. Right? And you, you have no memory of your mother, because you're little, right? And she shows you all kinds of evidence that you're her son, right? And you deny that she's, she's your mother, because you're the one who's being evil by denying your mother her right. Same thing here, by denying Allah SWT his right, you guys are the one who are being evil. It's not Allah. Okay? You denying Allah is 100 times worse than you denying your mother. So is, this is not an excuse. It's in Quran 6.27-28. to 28. It says, If you could but see when they are made to stand before the fire and will say, Oh, would that we could be returned to life on earth and not deny the signs of our Lord and be among the believers. But what they concealed before has now appeared to them. And even if they were returned, they would return to that which they were forbidden. And indeed, they are liars. You can read about this Quran uh, 6, 27 to 28. Even Kadir said, But if they were returned, they would certainly revert to that which they were forbidden. And indeed, they are liars, meaning they lie. When they say they wish to go back to this life so that they can embrace the faith. Allah states that even if they were sent back to the life of this world, they will again commit the disbelief and defiance that they were prohibited. So basically the point here is that Allah SWT says that during when people will be thrown in the hellfire, some of these people will say that please give us another chance so that we can go back and be a believer again. But the truth is, is that these people, even if they were to send back to give another chance to be a believer, they wouldn't believe. That's how arrogant these people are. Which means that these type of people who will go to the hellfire will never accept Islam no matter what Allah SWT do. Even if he himself like comes down or like shows miracles, these people will not accept. Because they're arrogant. Okay, they don't want to believe. It's very similar to the shaitan. Because the, the, the iblis or the devil knows that Allah exists, knows that he's all powerful. But he denies him anyway. So even if you give all the evidence in the world, he will still deny him. He will still disobey him. And that's the point. So these people, Allah knows. So when Allah sends someone to the hellfire, he knows that these people deserve it because he knows for a fact that they will never change. They will never accept him. They will never worship him. They will never obey him. Even though he has done everything for them. He has created them. He has taken care of them. They will never accept him. However, I'm not going to uh, sit here and say that, you know, you, Stephen, are going to go to hell. I don't know whether you will go to hell or heaven. I don't know. But the point here is that the people who will go to hell will deserve to be there. Because, they, first of all, there will be a trial. Okay? And on that trial, they will lose the trial. And then they will be sent into the hellfire. And Allah will know that these people deserve it. Because they will never change, okay? Even if they're given a second chance, they will never change. He knows this because he's all, he's all knowledgeable. So if you guys like the video, like, share, subscribe. And if you guys want to support me, then consider becoming a Patreon or you can support me on or by becoming a member on YouTube. So yeah, with this, I'm going to end this video. Thank you guys for watching. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.